Welcome everyone to In Dialogue with Kyung Eun Kang and Daisy Murray Holman. I'm Robert R. Shane, your host, art critic, and associate professor of art history at the College of St. Rose, Albany, New York. Tonight's conversation will be about Kyung Eun Kang's exhibition, Traces, 28 Days in Elizabeth Murray's Studio. Uh, the work was completed at the Elizabeth Murray Artist Residency and is now on view at Collar Works in Troy. We send a heartfelt thank you uh, tonight to all of those who have made the Elizabeth Murray Residency Program and this resulting exhibition possible. These include the estate of Elizabeth Murray, Bob Holman, Collar Works, and Collar Works' executive director, Elizabeth Dubbin. So allow me to introduce the exhibition first, and then I will introduce our speakers tonight. In Traces, Kyung Eun Kang uh, creates a contemplative and poetic exhibition that explores studio practice as an everyday ritual, one that is devotional, playful, and transformative. This exhibition also provides a unique opportunity to take a closer look at objects from Elizabeth Murray's barn studio. The exhibition presents a five hour long video uh, in three segments uh, on three separate screens that captures the full scope of Kang's daily performance. It also includes photographs depicting discrete choreographic gestures from that durational time-based video. Uh, it includes watercolor drawings replicating some of the marks in Murray's studio, as well as several of Murray's studio objects, uh, including a, a ladder, pallets, uh, a door, and painting tools, all of which Kang uses as props in her movement. Now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Kyung Eun Kang. She's a New York-based artist born in South Korea. She received her BFA and MFA in painting from Hong Ik University in Seoul, South Korea, and an MFA from Parsons New School for Design in New York. She works in a wide range of mediums from live performance to video, painting, photography, installation, text, and sound pieces. Her work explores geographic and cultural identity and universal human behavior, such as affection and attachment. Her work has been exhibited in numerous galleries and museums in New York City, Washington DC, Australia, um, and in the Museum of the Imperial City, China, and the National Museum of Modern Art in South Korea. Kang has also participated in numerous residencies, including the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. And she's the recipient of several fellowships including one from the New York State Foundation uh, for the Arts. Daisy Murray Holman is the daughter of Elizabeth Murray. She spent her summers on the farm in Washington County, New York, where Elizabeth, the Elizabeth Murray Artist Residency now takes place. Murray Holman, the head of the estate of Elizabeth Murray, also works closely with Collar Works to organize the residency. She's the head of the archives at the Richard Diebenkorn Foundation in Berkeley, California. And Murray Holman lives in Oakland, California with her family. Thank you so much, Kyung Eun Kang and uh, Daisy Marie Holman for joining us tonight. Uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to you, uh, to share Kyung Eun's work with everyone and to talk about the legacy of Elizabeth Murray. Daisy, I thought we could uh, start by Talking about some of your experiences on the farm growing up, you and your, sami, so, uh, you and your family uh, spent the academic year in New York City, and then you would retreat uh, upstate uh, around uh, beginning around 1985. Uh, what do you remember most about summers on, on the farm growing up? Hi, well, first I also want to extend my thanks to Robert for moderating tonight and to Collar Works for hosting the event and the exhibition and Elizabeth Dubbin in particular for her always incredible work with the residency. Um, and Kyung Eun Kang, it's really been a tremendous joy to visit your work over the past few weeks. Really transported me back to the farm where I haven't been able to be for, you know, over a year and a half due to the state of the world. And in terms of, my memories from growing up there, they relate to really truly being a child, which is very separate from the memories of my mother as an artist and what happened when she was in her studio. And that's something that really had to do with when we were in New York City during the school year, 
she wasn't working while we were home generally because she would stop the work day when we came back from school. And when we were up at the farm, she would work all day and we were either just keeping ourselves company or we had, there was, uh, there were a few other families that we would spend time with and they had older children that would watch us. So the memories of the farm are really of pure bucolic childhood and freedom, imagination, playing made up games. There's a stream that runs through the property and we would frequently walk through the stream. There's a little bridge that you have to walk over to go from the house to the barn. And we would hide under the under the bridge and play game, make believe games where we were fairies or we were trolls, all different types of creatures. So those memories feel very physical and they're also connected to the sights and sounds and smells of the place. In particular, the rainstorm that you, that Fent finished the excerpt are very much ingrained in when I think of that spot in particular. There are so many, everyone has their own most beautiful place in the world for them. And so much of that is related to connection and what we feel when we are at a place and something that has been incredibly rewarding, but also wonderful to see is how the residents who have been through the Elizabeth Murray Artist Residency have responded to that feeling as well. So seeing Kyung's performance brings that into fruition and also adds elements to my mother's story that we can no longer know for sure now that she has passed, which I find to be a really interesting part of the performance. And we'll turn to Kyungung's work in a moment, but as you're talking about how rewarding it is to see what the artists are doing with the residency, um, it, it makes me wonder, so how did the idea of the uh, residency come about to convert the, the, the space so something that we always noted was that it was a very particular place to be at, for, to reside in, but also the workspace was very peaceful and very removed where you could really drill down into your own mind when you're in the studio. And after my mother's passing, we were, I was 22 and my older sister was 25. We were out in the world and not spending as much time at the property. And we talked for years about how we could use the space, not just for our family, but to open up the doors and share our mother's experience at the space. And in 2017, my father through Bob Holman, through Daniel Nestor was hooked up with Collarworks and Elizabeth Dubbin. Elizabeth and Bob spoke and Elizabeth and Ken and Sanford, who are color board members, came to the farm and we walked through the property and there was immediately a comfort with the Collar Works team. A residency at the farm is something that had always been a personal dream of mine, but you can't accomplish something like this on your own. And it also felt really important to work with a, an arts nonprofit that was in the capital region. So to work with somebody that was outside of New York City and really knew the, the area. And also Elizabeth's experience in the area really uh, brought everything to life. So we were walking through the property and talking about what would make an Elizabeth Murray artist residency function as something other than uh, your standard arts, artist residency. And that's when we started talking about doing something for parents and how can we bring her legacy into the thread of the residency that we create. And Elizabeth and Rob and Ken and Sanford also really responded to the space. Here, you can see this is Bob right here in the plaid shirt. Um, really responded to the space itself. And the decision was made to leave that space open. Um, but after our first meeting within a couple of weeks, Elizabeth had worked with her board and they came back with a full proposal for how we would make the artist residency work. And at that point we were just so impressed and we felt like we could not work with Collarworks. 
it's been very rewarding and um, we hope that we are will be able to welcome residents again uh, in the not too distant future so that it's took it takes a, a a huge amount of energy to make a project like this happen and it's not just the organization from admissions but it's also the blood, sweat, and tears of physically transforming that old barn into a studio space for the residents to work in and clearing out the studio floor where our mother worked and where Kyungun made the performance also took a certain amount of work. So the ability to gently find the similarities between the studio space that where my mother worked and the studio spaces where the artists work has created an environment that we have heard and have seen has been um, very, created a productive space for the artists. Kyung Un, it was certainly a very productive space and time for you. Uh, and what's really interesting is uh, you hadn't, your initial proposal um, for this work, uh, did for this residency did not involve um, anything to do with Elizabeth Murray. Um, what had you originally proposed and then at, at what point did you start to think about using uh, Elizabeth Murray's studio space? Uh, first of all, I really thanks to um, Robert and Colorworks and the estate of Elizabeth Murray who believe in my project and supporting me a lot. So I'm very grateful for that. And my original proposal was uh, developing ongoing uh, photo series called uh, Stone from Korea. So for the last 10 years, I've been photographing a small stone, as you see here, a small stone from Korea. So small stone, which my mother sent me from Korea. And I uh, relocated this stone in the middle of a uh, um, North American forest. So the photos mainly focus on the stillness of the landscape, even with a subtle addition of the stone. Uh, often the stone is assimilated into uh, the new landscape. So this was my original um, proposal, but I knew it's gonna be the second project. It's gonna be the side project because whenever I visit uh, residency, I always don't have a, a fixed idea and it was my rule. <laughs> and whenever I visit places, I always inspire by uh, people I met there or visiting new places. So I was uh, looking for um, experiencing something new. So, so the idea of use, uh, the use of Murray Studio came when I first entered the studio. The studio was very open and it was more like a, 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 like a stage, open stage for me. The studio was empty, but I strongly felt her creative energy. And I uh, felt that the paint strokes on the wall are still alive and fresh. I didn't know uh, why, but I was really um, want to spend more time in the space and I wanted to work there. Usually res resident artists don't work in Murray's studio, but I requested to use the use of the her studio and luckily I could use her studio. <laughs> um, the work is very much about um, ritual uh, and you spent 28 days uh, in Elizabeth Murray's space, uh, it, uh, generally in the mornings before the other residents had entered into the studio. Um, and so uh, can you take us through a, a typical morning? Uh, what sort of rituals did you begin to develop as you inhabited <laughs> that mm -hmm. space and really meditated upon Murray's time there? Yeah, I, I wanted to build an, an intimate relationship to Murray's studio, hoping that in doing so, I might forge a spiritual connection with her. To do this, I needed to have a quiet and uh, in, intimate moment in the space. So 
I went to her studio in the morning between 7 to 9 a.m. when other residents are not there. <laughs> so I was rushing. <laughs> I was <laughs> running before they, they arrive. So every morning I changed my clothes, walk on the floor barefoot, and observed and examined the space for hours and hours. And that was my everyday morning rituals, I guess. And it's wonderful the way the video brings the viewer into that uh, ritual that we, that we can begin to experience it as well. Um, you, and I'm curious as to how you were thinking about your relationship to your audience as this was going on, because it is such an intimate um, process. I, I can imagine it might even be hard to uh, be thinking about someone else watching you as you're trying to just be with this space, um, to think about um, uh, Elizabeth Murray. Uh, and um, yet there are times when um, you seem really uh, conscious of, of, the, of the audience. Like for instance, you present the book for us, uh, putting it up to the camera so we get the artist's uh, point of view. Um, so yeah, what, what were you, how were you envisioning your audience as you were engaged in this rather intimate and private experience? Mm. So um, for this performance, I opened myself to visual and auditory information that the studio offered. So I wanted to capture that, um, uh, capture my responses to my experience being in studio. So I set up my camera in the middle of the studio and recorded uh, my daily practice for 28 days. So the only audience uh, when I performed was the camera. And really, when I think about it, I think most of the time I performed for myself. <laughs> but, but I wanted to show what I was looking, what I was singing to the viewers at the same time. So I was kind of a guiding and pointing at the things to look at. So that's why I kind of um, showing the pamphlet I found in the library because I was fascinated by um, the dis dis discovery. I, I, I was in this space and I, I found this image in the uh, pamphlet. So I was kind of a, want to match the two spaces, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you, you do that beautifully a number of times in the uh, performance. I have some slides that show you replicating uh, the space. So here, certainly matching up uh, yeah. the painting yeah. to the current. The, the yeah, I tried to also space. organize the object as it was. <laughs> we see Elizabeth Murray on the left working on that, that very same piece. Um, here's a, a photograph that I, I believe, Daisy, I think you took um, uh, uh, shortly after your mother had died of, of the way that the, the space looked as, as she left it. And we can see on the left how uh, Kyungun has uh, replicated that right, to, um, uh, to the T. In my uh, earlier conversation with Daisy, um, she remarked how many of your, the, pa, much of your movement, uh, Kyung Ong, uh, reminded her of, of Trisha Brown, the dancer and choreographer. And, and I, I thought the very same thing too. And, and Brown and Murray uh, were, knew each other and, and were friends. What have been some of your movement influences, uh, Kyung Ong? Uh, and if you haven't really been drawing from dancers per se, uh, then how do you, you generate your, your movement? Uh, and Daisy, feel free to chime in too at any point if you, um, with some of your thoughts about Kyunan's movement. Well, something that I was noticing after our conversation, Robert, and thinking a lot about just thinking about how my mother moved through the space. And Kyungun, when the way that the piece is split up into the three pieces, I think part one and part two start with you bringing a chair over and sitting and observing. And that there those moments of quiet of looking at the wall and seeing what was happening with the work, be that the traces of paint that we see today or be it the painting when she was there, either a blank canvas or a full canvas or halfway full canvas is very really evocative of how she would move through the space. 
but also I was reminded of a huge part of her life was her yoga practice, which she did every morning and every afternoon. And she did her yoga in the studio. She had a big roll that she would, at first it was this big old trifold mat that she would put out. So when you all of a sudden go down and lie on the floor on your back, really struck me as those moments of, you know, your Shavasana, your end of the practice and her, that she moved through the space, not only as an artist, but also as a, not only a person creating art, but also a person moving her body and seeing how her body would work and doing a headstand. And the way that you can communicate with the space around you, it's, it was quite startling to have that realization that you, how you really captured that movement of the, of going through the walls, interacting with the paint markings, but also resting, which are, which is something that she probably laid exactly in that spot for how many afternoons in a row for how many summers in a row. Yeah, the resonances between Elizabeth Murray's movement and Kyungun's are um, apparent even to those of us that hadn't met her. Uh, there's, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the comparison to show you, but there was one striking photograph I saw of uh, Murray on the ladder uh, that Kyungun mm -hmm. uses. And Murray's looking at one of her paintings and, and studying it. And Kyungun is looking um, at the, at the wall and inhabiting that space with that same sense of, of study. Uh, I too was really struck by those moments of rest. Um, I think there's an important quality of the mundane uh, in, this, in this performance. So we see not only Kyung Un performing, uh, so to speak, uh, shaping herself in response to the paint marks on the wall, uh, but we see her uh, drinking um, sitting down, laying down, and it and it really brings the uh, importance of the the mundane in in art making practice. You know, as we're thinking about an art making practice as ritual, uh, and I think also in terms of memory. You know, if we think of this work as a memorial to Elizabeth Murray, um, you know, so much of life is lived uh, in the in the mundane. If I think of the you know loved one I've lost. I often don't think of like these major moments, but the small ones, the way they held their hands or sat at a desk or, you know, uh, someone's gait. Yeah. So how was that experience for you, Kyung Un, as you're both generating your own movement, but also kind of memorializing someone else's movement? And you had, you know, you had been working with photographs and, and images of Murray in that space, the catalog. Yeah, so I was imagining how she uh, had uh, she had a, a work in her studio, and I was also thinking about how she um, spent her studio time on daily basis. And also, I wanted to uh, develop my own practice within her studio. It was kind of parallel kind of um, you know things to achieve. <laughs> so I was kind of. Um, I want to be very, uh, be myself and feel comfortable in the studio. So in the beginning of the stage, I, I was very vulnerable somehow. It was like I was wearing someone else's shoes. But <laughs> uh, very soon I felt very comfortable and I was very devoted and focused during the uh, 28 days. And I really want to uh, revive her studio through my movement. So I uh, observed every single um, paint strokes on the walls. And I even cleaned the studio uh, using brooms. And these, all these actions I consider as a scores. And as you said, you know, my movement is very uh, based on mundane activities and also often very playful. And for example, when I was, um, um, for example, I was dancing with a, a door. Uh, she used to use it as, as a makeshift table. 
and I also hide, hid behind her, her desk and also mm, mimicking, mimicking the shape of her leather. So I was kind of a playing. Uh, I was, it was like uh, my play, playground to experiment. Yeah, here you see, I was dancing with door <laughs> and and it was quite physical, you know, I, I have to move and shift this object and I was very exhausted and, but I, at the end, I was very fulfilled. I, I, I was very satisfied <laughs> by this hard work. <laughs> yeah, so I was very, um, it was pretty intense. So I was developing the movement every day and I add on the new one based on the, the previous previous movement. So I was repeating whole uh, scores uh, every day. So I would say the entire score without intermission is kind of, it's about an hour and a half. So I was uh, doing that practice every day and I was exhausted. When you're talking about in the intensity of the practice, there was a way in which her time, Murray's time in, the, in that studio in particular was very intense because we were removed from all of the additional daily requirements of her life that she had in New York City of being the wonderful requirements of seeing your friends or going to a museum, going to a gallery, going to the grocery store, you know, and getting exactly what you wanted to have for dinner. But when she was there at that studio, it was the same every day. Wake up in the morning, have your coffee. We would have breakfast. She would go out to the studio, bring her coffee with her, come back for lunch, then go back after lunch. And the routine was, was truly that for the entire period of time we were there without interruption, other than getting a phone call and one of us running the phone out to the barn. So that intentionality when it feels very clear and is a real thread between the two, your work in that studio and her work in that studio. Mm -hmm. Robert, you had asked me if I could tell any difference between paintings that were created at, in the barn or in New York City. Right. And I have memories of particular paintings being in the studio and we have some photographs of them Ayiyi, which is the painting in the photograph that's in the performance. Um, Unlock, which is a painting with a woman has a, a doorknob for a nose, wishing for the farm. Um, and there she is working on that painting. But she designed these, drew the canvas that, you know, made the maquette for the canvases in New York City, and they would be manufactured in New York City and then brought up in a big truck and they'd set up one or two or three, like two to three canvases, usually a summer, and she wouldn't necessarily complete them all. And then she'd bring them back to need to down to um, wherever, whatever, wherever her studio was at the time in New York City. So there was a there was a continuity between the two workspaces, and there wasn't necessarily a moment where she was, where I could see her responding to the light, in, for example, in that in the studio at the barn, in her paintings. Is that something that we really talk about when we talk about her work? Is that something that she would really talk about? Not in particular, her enjoyment of light, of course, and just in life and having natural light in her workspace. But the when she talked about the barn, she would talk about the sound a lot more of working in that barn. And, or also the, in the, the, the birds that you were hearing, there are swallows that live in the barn and fly through this, this, the big open door and come in and they roost in the barn. So there are, I don't, maybe there's one photograph in which you can see it. Can you see it in the video? But there are awnings over the painting walls because to prevent bird droppings from getting on the paintings. So she's taking care of all these practical elements in order to have her work occur. But the busyness of the natural world was very much in the space as well. So 
on the one hand, it is a retreat and it is this, you know, this beautiful open farm space, but it's also a, a, a very serious workspace, which we've seen Kyung Yun respond to and the other artists that have visited as well. That's interesting because uh, I was also struck by the nature around me, especially the bird chirping. So, so I really, that's why in my video is successful because I, I could record the sound. If it was in you know, a painting or object, I couldn't really capture that you know, sound and the liveness of it. So actually when I was working, I didn't really much hear the sound, but when I watched the video, suddenly, you know, the memory, you know, come, came back. Yeah. Yeah. And as the viewer, that sound becomes so important. I mean, on the surface, it seems like there's an absence of sound or at least a scripted sound, right? There's no musical score or anything like that. Um, and in the absence of any kind of speaking, save for the moments when you're reciting some of the, the poetry you found, um, in the absence of any kind of sound that you're making, every sound that we hear just becomes alive and vital from the scraping of the ladder across the floor to the birds uh, that we've spoken about. Um, I want to come back to this notion of the, the work and the, the labor that goes into this uh, performance. And there were a couple of things that, that struck me. You were, you were talking about, of course, the, the physical labor of moving the chairs around, uh, the table around, the, the ladder. Uh, but it also strikes me that it, it takes a lot of mental work, a lot of empathy uh, that must be um, psychologically demanding. Uh, you, you spoke a few moments ago of, in the piece, wanting to have your own movement, to be yourself, but to also be empathetic. You're also really studying uh, the way that um, Elizabeth Murray had used the space uh, and it, it, to me, that really connects with your larger uh, body of work. Uh, so if I think of um, some earlier pieces, uh, such as Flower Man, uh, where you're uh, documenting, uh, this was a, a video piece uh, in which the man who's selling flowers gives them to strangers. So we're seeing this kind of connection uh, between strangers Similarly, you had a video, the th or on a similar theme, a video of the Three Musketeers, uh, where you speak with um, three uh, restaurant workers, um, and uh, you get them to call you uh, Mia Moore, Moore. Um, my, my love. Yes, and I think maybe most striking for me is is this piece, Omaha Diary, where you spent um, I'm not sure exactly how much time you could tell us, but you you spent some time with this family, sort of exchanging. Um, rituals and and food rituals. Yes, yeah. So um, I met a um, ninety year old elderly couple when I was um, participating in uh, another residency in Omaha, Nebraska. So at that time, I was very uh, curious about how these people live in the middle of nowhere in America. <laughs> it was pure curiosity. And I was um, asking people around, I'm, I'm looking for an elderly couple. Can you recommend someone? So, so I, luckily I could spend uh, three months in Omaha. So I eventually met this couple, Jim and Andre. And uh, Jim is actually uh, from Native America and Andre was from Belgium. So what I did was I visited their home for three months and captured their daily rituals, such as walking the dog, eating lunch, going to the church, taking a nap, something like that. So in this scene, uh, actually, they asked me to uh, cook Korean food for them. So I prepare <laughs> Korean meal and share uh, our meal at their house. And it was the first time they taste a uh, Korean meal. And the most fascinating moment uh, happened when they asked me how to eat. Can you show me how to eat this food? <laughs> so I was uh, really uh, happy that um, my work is not just about observing, it's also about how they observe me. 
So I like that kind of dynamic between uh, two strangers and um, traversing the invisible human relationship and cre creating um, intimate bonds between us. So that was the moment I, I felt that, oh, this couple really trust me, which uh, it take a long time to do that. So I felt <laughs> I was very happy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so beautiful throughout your work, these relationships, these intimate bonds that become the subject of the work. And what's really moving in traces is the way you're connecting with someone who's absent now, someone we've lost. Uh, and uh, it makes me think of your um, earlier piece, Ghost Uncle. Um, you have an uncle, I, I think that you've never met, um, who yeah. uh, disappeared um, when he was young. And, and uh, tell, tell us about this ritual that you've enacted with your family here. Yeah, so to overcome my cultural displacement, I try to reconnect with my family in Korea through my work. So I uh, had an uncle, but I never met before because he was uh, murdered by a stranger at the age of 23. And, and he was uh, the one of the beloved one among uh, my mom's family. So everybody idolized him. And I really want to uh, know know him but I, I couldn't really know know him so I have to make this piece so I uh, recorded um, uh, my mom's family members record uh, recording remembering him but uh, not showing their faces but I, I only show the audio with a text on one channel and the other channel uh, is about uh, a unique uh, family gathering. So I invited all my family members in uh, Gosong area. Gosong was the place my uncle used to live. So they, they were looking down the village together. And the side was the ancient uh, burial mound. So it's kind of a dead kind of site but we cherish the site. So I was kind of thinking maybe it's a good place to, to shoot, yeah. Yes, yeah. What struck me when you were just speaking is that desire to uh, want to know someone uh, without being able to know them and the way you use um, place and ritual as a, a way to try to connect uh, and I think also, as we've started to see already tonight, um, the way that you use um, objects. Um, so you've, you've used them in your uh, performance uh, and also, cho and we, we can talk about that a bit, and also the translation um, from uh, taking those objects from the studio and bringing them into uh, the gallery. Um, so here we see you with um, one of the templates uh, that Elizabeth Murray would have used um, uh, here using the glass palette uh, caked with, with paint. Here's the photograph that you've used to demonstrate it. Um, the, uh, the door that we've spoken about, uh, you have her, her tabaret with the, um, the pliers that we saw in the video, some of her uh, varnish, uh, and again, a, a palette over here. Um, so the uh, you know, these everyday objects uh, for her seem to be a way of you trying to, to connect, um, to, to get to know her. Um, when did you decide to bring these objects into the exhibition space? And did that change the way that you, you look at them? Oh, uh, yeah, the idea of, of uh, bringing the actual object into the gallery space came late, actually. I didn't really... I dare thought about bringing that object to the gallery. I, I didn't know it's going to be possible, but I really want to show the physical object, which I uh, believe that the object still carry the spirit of Murray. And as you see, you, you see some, you know, uh, stains and there's a movement in, in the object, some kind of details that show the history of her actions or some kind of, um, you know, 
yeah, I like the kind of um, actions in the residue of actions in the in the work in the object. So, and also it's a very beautiful object. If you look at this uh, glass palette, it's almost like a Jackson Pollock's painting, or, or better than Jackson Pollock. Yes. You know, it's really really beautiful. And when I was actually working in the studio, I didn't wipe the dust. So I didn't really know it, it was very bright, you know, colored paint. But when, when I installed this piece, we clean up and it was like a gem. It was really uh, standing out. And in my performance, I was animating this object and interacting with it. So I, I thought it's good to show this object with the, the video. The video is is um it's not physical so i thought it's good to have some physicality in the space and i also display them in a specific way i wanted to make the viewers pay attention to each object so for example the door can you yeah show us oh. the door so the door was freestanding. Uh, I wanted to make it freestanding so the viewers can uh, see the front and back of the door as they walk around. It's almost like a sculpture. So here the objects are like a piece of art. Daisy, I'm wondering what your experience of these objects are. I, I know you're on the West Coast, uh, so you haven't been able to see the see them in the exhibition, but as you see them now and you've seen Kyung Ong using them in the in the performance, uh, what, what goes through your mind? Well, at first I was really recalling the muscle memory of moving the ladder. When you see Kyung Ong bring the ladder out and you hear, first you hear it click, 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 clank, click, clanking, clanking around and it move, moving and adjusting it and to, to rotate it, you have to kind of pick it up and move it. It's not, the wheels are, are old and small and it doesn't just curve and, you know, can't make sweeping moves with the ladder through the studio. It is very, you know, she would move it and have it stay where it was and move it back and forth, not on, in a, in a pair, in a, in a straight line, not necessarily would curve it. So that struck me immediately as being very clear that you have to physically involve yourself when you're moving this ladder. And then thinking about the how the ladder exaggerates, right here in particular with the shadows, the ladder exaggerates the changes in the light and the ladder went by how it casts its shadow on the walls at different times. And then I started to think about how when when Kyung Yun Come, when you come in and bring the objects in and you stand with like the the varnish and the bottle with the glue with has this that has the screws in it and you stand and you look at the wall where they're holding them or you when you have the little clamp and you're walking around making the noise with it mm -hmm. there's a way in which i really connect to that moment when you take an object and you see the beauty of the object as the object itself that is a beautiful glass bottle that you're holding that is infused with the person who used it but also the object itself carries something in it and but my mother did not fetishize objects in that way she really wasn't sentimental about the way that she would place the object on the table or for me when i look at that palette knife i think oh this is her palette knife and she used this palette knife and i remember exactly how she would use it on a canvas and the scraping and creating a different different textures within one color plane but for her she did not anthropomorphize the objects in that kind of way not just her own but of other people as well and there is a sentimentality that was not as much a part of her personality as I think it is a part of others. So I was really thinking about that. You know, it is, part of it is talking and speaking and feeling for someone who is gone and getting to know them in a different way. But it's also a personality trait of what we find to be important and what others don't. And there is that 
was something I was really thinking about when, with the objects and the difference between us observing it now and how different people are struck by different objects. You know, when you have the door standing in the middle of the exhibition, we can walk around it and remember that it was a door and how she used that. But for her, it was a table to put her supplies on. And there's a moment when you're holding the door up and you can really see the, um, the rings from all of her paint cans, right? So she would have all these little cans and there were some of them were tomato cans or cat food cans and they're there, you know, and it would probably, when you came across it at this point, it was, yeah, absolutely covered in dust and dirt and, you know, bird droppings and who knows what, but that uh, allowing the viewer to see it as 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 however they would like to i think is very special and is one of the great wonders of what happens in the period of time after somebody dies is that we are allowed to interpret their objects and i do believe that my mother would feel very comfortable with that so it's wonderful to have other people see the intimate objects in a way that I believe they it's wonderful to cherish them in that way even though she might not have so and I really also love the um, the dust and haze behind some objects it's really yeah. capturing the situation in the studio and and also I love some butters written rabbit skin with a funny uh, drawings and uh, I felt it's very humorous and it captured also her personality somehow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love how you um, held the little foam right you can see that little the little palette that's there on the table mm -hmm. I've always loved that funny table. Yeah I love it too. Those those little palettes she would cut all these pieces of foam core up at a certain point, you see, you can see Kyungyun holding up small pallets that are about this big. Yeah, and she yeah. would have stacks of these small little pallets so she could lightly carry, you know, walk around with them and mm -hmm. make just a little bit of paint when she needed it. So it's yeah. Here's the rabbit skin glue. Um, for those not familiar, it's a very traditional way to prepare a a, a canvas. Uh, it goes back to the uh, Renaissance, perhaps uh, perhaps earlier. Um, and yeah, it struck me, Daisy, how you were talking about the, the kind of difference in personality, you know, for your mother, it wasn't important to really turn objects into, into relics, um, but, you know, it becomes a way for us to access her in a certain way, to, to know her. And Kyungong, you know, you've really um, come back to that idea of what the object can represent and how it connects to other people um, throughout your work. You know, so this idea of the relationship, the intimacy is, so, is a central theme in your work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think specifically of your care package uh, series, um, here's one of the care packages on the right. These are ones that your, your mother would pack and ship to you when you were in the United States, right? Yeah, and I have some of the performance still. still ending me the care package, still doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, this care package become um, um, a basis for my ongoing performance called care package. So I receive a lot of uh, daily objects like uh, towers, as you see, towers and some mushrooms and some detergents for specific laundry, uh, specific laundry. And you see a stone, interesting shaped stone. And actually in this box, for this box, I re-edited uh, the object I received to create some sculptural um, object. And if you go to the next uh, slide, you will see I'm performing uh, with the object she sent me from Korea. So I was uh, intuitively uh, using these materials for example, I was uh, holding or tasting, smelling, eating the objects she sent me. And also in, I invited the public to, to eat 
and smell and share with others. So I usually bring the, up the care package without knowing what's inside and open the care package in, uh, among the public. So there are lots of surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, certainly. <laughs> Uh, we'll um, probably move to Q&A soon, but kyung I, I know you want to talk about the, the poetry that you found in Elizabeth Murray's studio. Yeah. And we have a video clip of you reciting some of that. Maybe we'll play about a minute of, mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Unity of feeling. Unity of feeling. Unity of feelings. Unity of feeling. Form is form, a spirit in itself. Cultivate your own garden. Nothing but art. We have art in order not to die of the truth. So actually, this is a uh, um, underlined text from Murray's personal art book collection. So I found some uh, books. I I also spent time in Murray's library quite a lot, and I found some uh, interesting. Um, highlights, highlighted text from Murray's book. So I was uh, reading what was uh, important for her, probably. <laughs> he was, I think, very studying hard, you know, he, he, uh, she lined every single page. And also I, I could find some doodles on the, on the book page. So it was very, I, I feel like she was avid reader. Yeah. And I think those, the written and spoken word become such important um, metaphors when we're thinking about absence, presence, loss to inhabit someone else's words, someone else's writing. Um, you know, we leave writing as traces, uh, to use your exhibition title, uh, so that our words can be remembered after us. And similarly with art uh, and with the, with the objects that you've um, collected and, and exhibited uh, in the in the in the exhibition, um, and I, I think about the way uh, you brought together these ideas of ritual and time and remembering uh, themes that we've seen throughout your work, uh, from from Ghost Uncle now to the uh, to the present, uh, and it, it it strikes me that the uh, residency itself um, has become a kind of ritual that continues Elizabeth Murray's ritual, right? She was in this space working. Now other people come to work in the space, bringing their own rituals, responding to hers. And the cyclical nature of a residency, right? Each year taking on a, you know, there's a new season of, of people becomes a, a ritual, right? You know, a ritual performed once isn't a ritual, right? It, it has to be repeated. Um, and I feel like the, the repetition of a residency where you have um, 
new people coming in each year to continue a tradition, but bringing new thoughts um, really just um, resonates with, with that, these very beautiful notions coming through in your exhibition. One of the things that is, can be hard to accomplish in a residency is that it is a finite period of time. And for Hyung Yoon, she had a, a month at the residency, but for most of the artists, it's two weeks. And then for the families, it's a week. So it, Kyung Yoon's work, this project is really an example of what a, an extensive amount of time can do. But also not every artist is, that's, that's not their prerogative when they go to a residency is to create a ritual. It's almost to shake things up. And that's when something you'll see what happens. And you, you know, with this very abbreviated time you have to create a new routine, you might have a real breakthrough in your work, which is emblematic of Marie's time there herself is that she was breaking from her, you know, day, the real daily routine that she had in, in New York City. And what well, we, you know, that September to, or August, September to, you know, May, June, that kept her preoccupied. So the, she was kind of giving herself her own residency and that was her annual routine. So there's an annual routine and then there's a monthly routine and there's your daily routine. And it, ha it has to be, you know, the residency, the Elizabeth Ray Artist Residency this summer would have been the third summer, the second official summer. And we, you know, we are also all existing in this, liminal space where our routines, where we've all created new routines that we've never had before. So it's, this is a mo, this conversation is talking about a routine that has, was broken in a way. And it's, it's good to all come together at a moment and think about how that time did exist. And for all of us who have spent, and I think there are a lot of people who have attended the residency who are here tonight, for all of us to, to spend a little bit of time to think about the space and how it, you know, it still is there and it still exists. And um, that is heartening to take this moment as we are all in a, maybe in a darker hour than we were <laughs> previously. Um, so what, how do routines that existed that we are no longer taking part in sustain us when we can't take part in them anymore as something that I feel is very powerful from the from the performance and from the exhibition. And that these were objects that were very much a part of someone's routine for years. I mean, that table and the bottle were the, the bottles that she reused over and over again. She'd refill the bottle, you know, she'd bring in the big jug of turpentine and refill the same bottle every summer and multiple times a summer. So she'd refill that little, what you don't see, something you don't see on the screen is there's this little white cabinet off to the side and she'd refill that with all of her supplies. So she'd come in and the state space would stay the same and she would, you know, as you'd say, you know, imbue it with life again, but that what happens when we can return to something and how does that give our brain, how, what does that, what new patterns can that create and what kind of break can that give our brains? I think is very, is very powerful and something we're really, the, the residency has given us, uh, you know, those at Colorworks were involved. And I think, and for myself in particular, it's really given us something to look forward to um, when we see, especially when we see the residents come and then respond to the space and the creation of that new routine. Thank you so much, Kyungun Kang and Daisy Marie Holman. Uh, let's turn to our audience now. I have a great question here from uh, Carol Saft. Um, she would like to know about uh, some of your, your first moments uh, in that space, Kyung Un. Um, Carol, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? I can do that. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, can you share with us the first moment you became active out of the silence of the space? Mm, that's a very good question. So I was uh, observing lots of um, paint strokes on the walls. And I found few uh, uh, particular uh, marks. Some marks are like, uh, it seems like Murray drew intentionally, something 
there was a finger marks and some kind of a circle. It doesn't look like a random uh, strokes. So as soon as I saw that uh, significant uh, sign or symbols, I naturally move my bodies. Somehow I want to remember or I want to reinterpret the stains or strokes through my bodies to understand. Yeah. Okay, so you em embrace that mark by mirroring it with your body. Yes, I was. So, yeah. so, so you can begin to have a conversation with those marks. Yes, and also uh, I, uh, I uh, made a watercolor drawing mirroring the marks as well. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, we, have, uh, we have another question from uh, an artist I highly admire. This is Danilo Rumult. Um, and she has a, a, a question about the periods of rest and, and meditation. Hi, thank you. Um, this is such a beautiful talk and um, collaboration. I really enjoyed listening to it and uh, watching the videos. I was very moved. Um, my question was about the moment in the f video when you were using, I think they were pliers and you started to clap them together and it really through the sound and the movement to me uh, reminded me of the Zen clappers. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I have to see the video again. I don't remember if you were still before that action happened, but in, in Zen ritual, um, it's used as a symbol from moving from rest into movement um, mm -hmm. between transition. So I was wondering if that was an intentional uh, That's thought. Great. Yeah, good symbolic. questions. Yeah, I was uh, also, I wanted to create a sound to awakening, kind of to awake. Mm -hmm. And also I, now I'm thinking, I look like a kind of a shaman, <laughs> shaman <laughs> to connect the spirit to the physical world. You know, you know, usually shamans dance and they use some instrument, you know, to bring the spirit to the, the real life. But I'm not shaman, shaman, but, but I kind of, uh, I believe in shaman and spiritualism. I grew up in a, in a country that uh, still we believe in shamanism. So I, I feel like uh, uh, I have it in my blood. <laughs> yeah, and I also want to uh, play with the objects. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want to also enjoy myself doing this you know so yeah thank okay. you yeah. yeah thank you thank you so much for your question um daisy I'm, I'm wondering if you could comment on your mother's if she had any spiritual practices meditation and i'm also just thinking of um chogyam trungpa uh, the spiritual leader who said that all artists meditate all artists sit you know when mozart sits down at the piano there's a moment of just stopping clearing one's mind and having a relationship with the uh, with the music but were, were there any kind of um any kind of explicit spiritual themes uh, that were important to elizabeth murray well she grew up in a catholic family and was you know went to church and it was uh, irish catholic chicago illinois roots and left that behind when she moved to, when she went to college and moved to New York and then was in New York in the, in the city in the seventies and was definitely surrounded by Buddhism and meditation and uh, had a you know very good friends who one of her best friends is a, is a Buddhist and a very serious Buddhist. And she was not very interested in meditation when she was younger, but but her yoga practice was a very serious practice and something that was a real routine. And I do think went beyond just that it was more than a physical routine for uh, practice for her. But when she got sick, she did begin to meditate quite seriously. And even before then, there is a way in which the practice, um, her art practice was just as you said was a form of medicate meditation and when i when kyungyun was just talking about spirituality and when she walks through the space waking up the spirit and looking like a, having the appearance of, of, a, of a shaman almost 
for us as her, as Murray's family, the space in which uh, her spirit is still exists really, if there's a physical place, it is the farm. You know, there are places in New York, of course, where she lived and where we you know, lived with her, but we don't live there anymore. So if we are to coexist with her physically, that is where we need to be. And she's actually, the, the summer that we met Elizabeth and Collar Works and the residency all started was 10 years after her death. And it was when we finally found a resting place for her ashes, which is not far, which is at a cemetery that's not far from the farm. So I do feel a real spiritual connection between herself and that land in particular. And when you are, observing that performance, it feels very clear that there is, for me, I felt a real connection between you, Kyung Young, and her in that space. And there is definitely a wake, you know, waking up when you hear that clank. And then the the birds and the rainstorm further elaborate that relationship and the, almost the um the, the traces, but almost the, the trance-like state that can happen when you're, when you're there and when you're really allowing yourself to communicate with a spirit. So I felt it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kyung Ung Kang and Daisy Murray Holman. Uh, this evening has just been enlightening and, and wonderful. Thank you for sharing your artwork, uh, your stories. This has been a great way to celebrate Kyung Ung's exhibition and Elizabeth Murray's memory and legacy. Uh, and thank you to all of you who joined us uh, tonight and for your questions and for your presence. Taking us uh, out, uh, we'll have some outro music by Maria Callas, the, the famous opera singer, uh, one who inspired uh, Maria Callas, as, uh, inspired Elizabeth Murray, as you can see on this quotation here. Uh, as we head out, feel free to unmute yourself and say goodbye. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, be well and be safe. Thank you. Thank you thank so you, much, Robert. everyone. Thank you, Kim Young. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rob. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice day. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.